All right, guys, we're going to talk about the development of slavery in the colonies. It is the basis um, of our economic system and, and the system of mercantilism in many ways in the early colonies. It has a lasting legacy that you can trace even to today. So we're going to kind of get into that history a little bit of the development of slavery. We know that... Um, in places like the Chesapeake region and Virginia, many of the people that came were coming as indentured servants. Again, they were signing a contract that would um, basically bind them to someone to pay off debts. Usually they were also paying off their passage to the colony um, for a fixed amount of time. It is known that about half of all the indentured servants that came to the colonies actually only had an average of three years on their indentured contracts. Um, people would also sign up for indentures to avoid going to jail um, or to avoid the death penalty. Um, so this is how most folks came, especially to those middle colonies. Um, this is different than actual what we will become chattel slavery. Uh, and chattel slavery is owning another person and treating them like a good rather than a human being. Um, here you'll actually see bills of sale. These are not contracts between the slave and an owner. These are literally receipts for the sale of human beings. Um, this bill of sale, for example, would be a contract between a slave owner and a potential buyer. It would list things like the amount the slave was sold for, their gender, their name. And if this person that was being sold was a female, it would guarantee the new owner the rights of any future children that this woman would have. So very different than adventured, indentured servitude. But initially in the early 1600s in the colonies, they were both being used for um, manual labor pretty equally, um, probably more indentured servants than slaves. And they were treated fairly equally. Um, but what you start to see in the 1600s is there, and you saw this on the ship manifests, there's a severe shortage of single women or women under the age of 18. Um, and because of that, you're you're not having people who can make families and, and have future generations of workers. So there's a need for more women in the colonies. You start to see some women coming as indentured servants, but really they're going to come as a result of a marriage more than anything. In the West Indies, the conditions were really, really harsh. Um, and oftentimes people who were going to the West Indies would die of things like malaria and typhus and typhoid. And that meant that these indentures were actually costing plantation owners a lot of money. Um, and so they needed to find a cheap substitute for indentured labor. Also, you would have people who were highly skilled and educated. They would negotiate shorter contracts. Again, that's costly to a, a plantation owner because you go into that effort of training someone and then they're gone. So you have to train someone else. can be pretty costly in, in a business sense. Um, Again, indentures were a way to avoid the death penalty. And in fact, records from 1718 indicate that the average indenture for minor crimes, so if you were going as a criminal, average was about seven years, um, 14 years for major crimes. The average in general was three years. Like if I just wanted to pay for my passage, I was likely to spend three years in indentured servitude. So slavery becomes a cheaper alternative. Initially, the price up front is expensive, but if you are considering that, then you will have, especially if you have female slaves, the children of those females to then continue to be slaves. Um, you have a longer work life from your slave and the potential of generations of work life from those slaves. Um, so, you also have this issue of this availability of free land. Now we know Native Americans were there, but there was a perception that it was free and available in the frontier areas. And so this led to a lot of indentured servants wanting to escape, like they would get here and then they would be in these indentured conditions and not like it and they'd want to escape and, and go out to the frontier.
as we move through the 16th and 17th centuries, the cost of passage from Europe fell. Um, so it's not worth it anymore. It's like, I'll just pay however many pounds it costs to get across the ocean and do my own thing versus have to work three years to pay it off. Um, there's also better wages and more opportunities happening on the continent and in England. And um, the population growth starts to be imbalanced. And so we needed more women. And I mentioned that before. So the first slaves um, or first Africans, I should say, we don't know uh, for sure if they were slaves. Um, they're just mentioned as Negroes. Uh, arrive in the new world in Jamestown in 1620. What you see very quickly happening as slavery starts to take off in popularity is that um, black codes are being passed in places like Virginia, um, which would define race and slavery. So the first captured Africans that came to um, Virginia were on the ship, the White Lion. It was a Dutch ship that had captured 20 Africans from a Spanish ship that it had defeated in battle. And basically, those Africans were traded for um, repairs and supplies. Um, it, it, there's been mentioned that they were essentially indentured. So they, they weren't necessarily slaves. They may have become and been indentured servants initially. But what this does mean is that you're seeing more and more Africans being imported into the colonies. Um, and as people are treating these in, these indentures and slaves harshly, I mean, manual labor is hard, um, these folks start to run away based on these treat, this treatment. So you would see in local newspaper advertisements for runaway indentured servants. And in some cases, these indentured servants were running away with slaves and they would be being searched for um, and being asked to be returned. Um, there were punishments for running away, legal punishments, and they started to be meted out differently. And in fact, there's some stories of, of slaves running away with indentured servants, and the punishment for the two once they were captured was very different. So you're starting to see the evolution of a hierarchy in colonial society, and the base of that is going to be um, slaves. Uh, and you see this being denoted by a color line and race starts to actually play a pretty major role in who are slaves, basically. Above slaves, you have free blacks, very small group of people. And then you have poor whites, former indentured servants. Then you have artisans and craftsmen and planters at the top of the social hierarchy. Um, so race was then used to define freedom. Even free blacks were not necessarily protected if they didn't have documentation that could prove that they were not slaves. So their position in society was very, very tenuous. Um, and so we start to see laws being passed that says that the condition of servitude or slavery was based on race and the color of your skin. Um, and you see these laws being made in 17th century legal codes that the status of black period people would be deteriorating as the status of white people um, was increasing. So Often slaves and indentured servants, as I mentioned before, would run away together, but those slaves would be punished more harshly. And here's an example of a court case in 1640 where the punishment for three serv servants who ran away, one was Dutch, one was a Scottishman, and one was African. Um, and this shows the interracial cooperation among the servants at the time, but it also shows that there's legal differences about how we're viewing these people starting to evolve. John Punch, who was the African, um, becomes enslaved by law. It says here in the document that the Scotsman and the Dutchman shall serve out their times with their master according to their indentures, plus a whole year apiece after that time has expired. So their punishment is adding a year to their indenture. For the African gentleman, by their said indentures, the law sustained of their absence, that's the first part, um, and that the third being named John Punch, he's a Negro, shall serve his said master for the time of his natural life. 
So you can see the inequality. The first two guys get a year added to their indenture. The third guy, who happens to be African and Black, gets his life added to his indenture. So again, designations based on race. This goes hand in hand with laws that are being passed in Virginia, Maryland, um, where you see the words that like Negroes, um, Moors, Muslims, mulattoes being used to regulate the behaviors of um, Africans on the continent. So for example, the Virginia one, uh, Negroes sh shall not be allowed to have firearms and ammunitions. Um, the Maryland law code was considered an, an anti-amalgamation law, which meant you couldn't race mix. Um, and if you did marry a slave as a white person, then you could become a slave. So essentially it's disincentivizing those relationships. Um, the ability to be baptized as a Christian formerly had been a, a way to get out of slavery um, because slavery is looked down upon in the Bible in some places. But in this case, Virginia is passing a law that says, no, 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 no. You're still a slave, even if you're a Christian. And then you see in Virginia that um, people who are uh, Negro and are not Christian um, will be slaves. So we're seeing that being defined by race. These were known as Black Codes. Then in 1676, we have a pretty significant turning point in our history. Wealthy plantation owners could vote. Indentured servants and poor farmers could not vote in the local and state, or well, they weren't states, colonial elections. And as indentured servants became free and had taken their own land, they were given land that no one wanted. Um, it usually wasn't very productive farmland. This led to discrimination and frustration. And um, you see Bacon's Rebellion was the first rebellion in the um, colonial America. And it was a protest against the governor, William Berkeley of Virginia. Um, these colonists, who many of whom had been former indentured servants, were pushing into the frontier and wanted Berkeley to protect them. And Berkeley wanted to not do that. Um, Bacon wanted the colony to retaliate for raids against these Native Americans. Um, and he pushed for that and wasn't getting it. And so what you see as a result of this is that um, people start to see that you have sort of these wild indentured servants who are making demands. So if we don't have indentured servants, when they're done with their contracts, they won't make demands, if that makes sense. So basically, plantation owners and the wealthier leader, like indentured servants, are politically giving us a headache. So how do we avoid that headache? Well, we just don't use indentured servants anymore. And we start to switch to slavery. Um, and that's what you start to see as um, more and more laws are passed to restrict uh, Africans. Um, again, Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves within the Dominion shall be real estate and shall be property, essentially. Um, and you're seeing fewer and fewer indentures happening in the colonies. Now, it wasn't like instant overnight, as with any turning point. Sometimes it can be very quick and rapid, and sometimes it's more slow. This had been evolving before Bacon's Rebellion, and it was continuing to evolve after Bacon's Rebellion. But you see a significant uptick in slavery and a decrease in Indentured, indentured servitude after Bacon's rebellion. As a result of this, um, slavery becomes a very lucrative business, um, and the importation of slaves increases dramatically to all parts of the New World. They're being taken from West Africa and being brought first to the Caribbean and then to ports both in North and South America. Um, Oftentimes, slaves would be separated by clans so they couldn't coordinate on the ships um, and, and rebel. Um, 
families were separated and sold. It was a very devastating thing. Ships were built specifically and designed specifically to house as many people as they could to get across the ocean. Entire industries were being built around slavery. Um, and slaves become property. They are chattel. Any slave that's trying to run away could be killed. Um, owners refusing to abide by slave codes were even punished. So it was enforcing on the whites who owned them um, these laws as well. And they weren't allowed to work in for pay. Um, so they were totally um, hamstrung. By the mid-1800s, foreshadowing into the future, looking for continuities and changes over time, the Civil War breaks out in 1861. It is unmistakable that our U.S. economy is based on this foundation of free labor um, from this slavery. Entire industries, shipbuilding, um, insurance companies, banks were all investing in this slave economy. Meanwhile, millions of people were held in bondage. So that's kind of how slavery evolved in the colonies. Um, we're going to continue to explore slavery throughout American history and the lasting effects of it. And it wasn't unique to the British either. You have in places like French colonies down in Louisiana, the French in 1685 passed um, code, what was called Code Noir. These were laws that defined slavery and limited the activity of Negroes um, and in those colonies. So race is starting to be defining characteristic of slavery in the 1600s. All right. That is where we're going to take off. Now let's go look at some primary source documents.